Greetings everyone and welcome back. I hope you're ready to learn more about STM32. We got some pretty cool stuff today. Today we're going to spend some time drilling into the code that's generated by CubeMX. The goal is to understand what it's doing behind the scenes. After that, I'm going to show you where you can go to find the answers to any questions that you might have when you're trying to learn something new. We're going to start with the PWM implementation that we did in the last video and then tear it down all the way to bare metal. In case you missed the last video, here's a quick recap of what we did. In my last video, I talked at a very high level about what PWM is. I covered buzzwords like duty cycle, resolution, and frequency. And today I want to take a closer look at what we need to do to get our STM32 to do PWM. Let's start with high level stuff and work our way down to a bare metal implementation. We'll kick things off by looking at the code that CubeMX generates for us. In the last video, we used CubeMX to set up PWM. And this ends up generating code which does all of the magic for us. Next, we're going to look at the hardware abstraction layer and see how we can control PWM with that. We saw one example of HAL being used in the last video when we used it to start the timer. And finally, we're going to tear down that HAL implementation to see what registers are actually being changed behind the scenes. Spoiler alert, this is one of the registers we're going to look at. Let's take a second to review some of the most important stuff that we covered in the last video. The duty cycle is a percentage, and it means how long the signal is high compared to low. Over here, we have a video of PWM with an increasing duty cycle. Next up is resolution. This is essentially how many clock ticks make up one PWM cycle. In the video over here, you can see that the blue signal has a worse resolution, so it seems to be a little bit choppier. But the yellow signal looks nice and smooth. And this is because the blue signal has a lower resolution than the yellow signal. Lastly, we have frequency. The PWM frequency is how many cycles we have per second. In this video, we can see that the blue signal repeats four times as often as the yellow. This means that blue has a higher frequency than yellow. Let's start with the highest level, CubeMX. These are the settings for a timer that we saw in the last video. The only two settings for this timer that we changed were counter period and auto reload preload. Actually, I need to interrupt myself here. Mark Day pointed out to me in the comments that auto reload preload does something different than I've been explaining. With that being said, I've already recorded a lot of this video, so I'm just going to leave it in for now. Just know that enabling or disabling this parameter won't affect your PWM signal at all. And if you're curious what this actually does, I'll explain it at the very end of the video. The counter period just tells our timer what number to count up to. I chose 255, but you could choose whatever you want. This just means that we're going to count from 0 to 255, start over, and repeat that process indefinitely. Since the timer is set up and running, we're able to work with the PWM channel. The pulse value affects the duty cycle, and I set mine to 25. This just means that our output's going to be high from 0 to 24, and then drop low until we hit that maximum value of 255. If you do the math, this comes out to a roughly 10% duty cycle. Now all of this configuration that we did in CubeMX ends up generating code, which you can see here. Auto-generated code like this was one of the reasons that STM32 seemed so overwhelming for me to learn for the first time. Now I don't just want to say, hey, don't look at this code, it's auto-generated, you don't need to worry about it. While that is kind of true, I find it pretty comforting to understand what's actually happening. So let's see if we can make some sense of this code. Right now there's a lot of stuff here, so let's see if we can simplify it a little bit. I highlighted a little chunk of code here, and let's see what's actually happening. This is what this little chunk of code looks like. The meat of the code is really this HAL call, where we're actually initializing the PWM. But everything outside of that red rectangle is really just for error handling. You typically don't want to remove error handling, but in this case it makes our code a lot cleaner and easier to read. So let's just strip out the code that actually checks to see if init returned OK. This condenses this chunk into a single line of code, and it's pretty easy to understand what it's doing now. So let's take a look at the full generated code again. We can see that they do this trick about six times. So let's condense these into one-liners, before and after. We still have a little ways to go. Next, I'm going to remove these comments. Now once again, I'm only doing this to make our code more readable. These comments actually perform a pretty important role when it comes to generating code, so you don't want to get rid of them normally. After removing those comments, this is what we're left with. At this point, the text is big enough to read. Now I'm going to organize these into smaller, bite-sized chunks of code. The goal of reverse engineering this code is not to understand every little detail that's happening. It's more just to give us a level of comfort to understand what CubeMX is doing behind the scenes. So I'm just going to look at this from a very high level and not focus on all of the nitty gritty details. Let's run through this one chunk at a time. This first chunk just declares some complex variables that we're going to use later in the code. Here's the three variables and I color coded them as red, green, and blue. And these end up getting used later on. What they're actually doing will make sense in just a little bit. So for now, let's look at the next chunk. The meat of this chunk of code is really just this very last line of code. And this only takes one argument, which is HTIM2. All of the lines before this are really just configuring that variable. 
Maybe you're asking yourself, why does it look like this? Let's look at an alternative. To do the base initialization of this timer, we need these six arguments. So one way to handle this would be to create a function that just takes in six arguments. However, ST decided to tackle this problem a little differently. So instead they create these complex variables or type definitions. Here's an example of one called Tim underscore handle type def. And this is really just a collection of all of the parameters that are needed to set up that base timer. So we create a variable called htim2 and set it equal to this complex variable type. So now when we're ready to call hal tim base init, we just have to pass in that one variable. All of these settings live within this htim2 variable. And also this ampersand is C syntax for pass by reference. That has to do with things called pointers in C programming and I'm not gonna cover that in this video. So if we revisit this code, we can see that the first couple of lines of code are actually just setting all of the settings. And then this last line is where we pass in that complex object and actually initialize the base timer. Let's put this chunk of code side by side with the CubeMX configuration tool. Is this starting to make sense yet? Every parameter that we set in CubeMX ends up generating a line of code. So CubeMX is actually pretty cool. It gives us a graphical way to see all of the parameters instead of memorizing a bunch of code and maybe forgetting a line or two. Okay, let's move on to the next chunk. Here we see the same pattern. We have some complex variable, which I forgot to tell you is called a struct. We set the parameter of the configuration variable, which in this case is the clock source, and then we pass that configuration variable into this hal call, which then actually sets the clock source. If you're curious, this is the drop-down menu in CubeMX, which affects this variable. This was part of the setup for timer two. The next chunk of code is just a hal call. It doesn't have any configurations to set up. Up next, we have this master config. And this works the same as everything else. We set the parameters of the master config variable here, and then pass that variable into the actual hal call, which then sets the master config synchronization. Once again, this chunk of code pulls its variables from this part of CubeMX. And once again, we have a same chunk of code here, which sets the sconfig OC part, and this affects channel one of our timer. Here you can see where we're setting our pulse value of 25. And these variables are set from this part of CubeMX. This next part is a mistake on my end. I was playing around with channel four and I forgot to undo my changes before taking this screenshot. However, it is pretty cool to see that this is the only code that gets added to add another channel to your timer. You might even notice that it's using the same sconfig OC variable that we used to set up channel one. That means that it has all of the same settings as channel one and the only thing that's different is it has a pulse value of zero instead of 25. And then this last chunk of code is called MSP post init. I haven't actually looked at this before, but it looks like it's code that's intentionally set to run post initialization or after the initialization. But have no fear because as part of this video, we're gonna look at some HAL documentation and we'll be able to figure out what this actually does. And that's pretty much it. I hope this gave you some insight as to what's happening behind the scenes when CubeMX is just generating all of this magic code. It's almost like every setting in CubeMX generates one line of code. So when you put the two side by side, it's actually pretty easy to understand. It's also pretty cool to just look at the HAL calls that are generated. Essentially, these are the five commands that are used to set up PWM. For now, let's just jot these down and we'll revisit them in a bit. Now we've looked at the code that CubeMX generates, so let's move one level lower and take a look at how HAL is used to set up PWM. Everything that you need to know about HAL can be found in the HAL documentation. The documentation for HAL is slightly different between different families of microcontrollers, and since we're using the blue pill, which is the STM32F103C8T6, we want to search for the F1 HAL documentation. The documentation between different families of microcontrollers is very similar, so there's a lot of overlap between the different HAL documentations. And this is what the HAL documentation looks like, a modest 1,208 pages of technical documentation. If you want to read the whole thing, no one's going to stop you, but I like to use the table of contents. I'm looking for some PWM stuff, and I think that falls within the timer documentation, so if I scroll down here, I can eventually get to the section I'm looking for. When looking through the table of contents, you can expand or collapse these menus to see more. Most chapters tend to be broken up into these three parts. The first section talks about structures, or the structs that we saw earlier. Here's an example of the stuff that you would see within this section. And this looks very similar to the example I gave earlier when we were breaking down the CubeMX generated code. The next section is the API description, which is human readable instructions as well as function definitions. In this section, you can find things like how to use this driver, which tells you exactly what you need to do to get this to work. This section is a goldmine when you're trying to learn something new. The last section is a collection of defines. This is really just a giant list of all the define statements. These are used when setting up the structs or maybe calling functions. 
Let's try to figure out how to use PWM by just reading the HAL documentation. My favorite place to start is the section called How to Use This Driver. It gives us a step-by-step -step explanation of what we need to do to set everything up. For timers and PWM, there's six steps. So let's walk through these one at a time and keep a running list of all of the functions that we need to call to get this working. Let's start with step one. This is telling us to initialize the timer's low-level resources. We have a list of functions below, and we're going to use whatever one seems to be the most relevant to PWM. And they have a bullet point specifically for PWM. So that means that we need to use this hal tim pwm msp init. We're going to add this function to our running list of things that we need. Step two. Step two looks like it's more low-level resources. Part A tells us to enable the timer interface clock with this function. So we'll go ahead and add that to our list. Part B tells us how to set up the timer pins using this function. And the next bullet point tells us to set these up in alternate function mode using hal gpio init. So we'll add this to the list as well. Step three. Step three tells us how to use an external clock if needed. We're just gonna be using the internal clock, so that means that we can skip this step. Step four. Step four is telling us to configure the timer in the desired functioning mode. And we're gonna do this by using some of the initialization functions listed below. Up first, we have hal tim base init, which says that it generates a simple time base. So let's go ahead and add that to our list. The next bullet point that seems applicable to us is the stuff that talks about PWM. And they list hal tim pwm init and hal tim pwm config channel. And it specifically tells us that these are used to generate a PWM signal. So let's add these to our list. Step five. Now it's time to activate the timer peripheral. So we're gonna use one of the following start functions depending on what we're doing. Since we're using PWM, we wanna use one of the PWM start functions. In this case, they list three different things that we can pick from. We've got just a normal start, we have start with DMA and start with interrupt. Direct memory access and interrupts are more advanced ways to use PWM, but we're just gonna to stick to a normal start. So let's add this start function to our list. And finally, step six. Step six describes something called DMA burst. And as I just said, we're not using direct memory access, so we can skip this step. And that was the last step. So now we have a list of all of the functions that we need to call to get PWM set up. Let's compare this side by side with the functions that were generated by CubeMX. You can see that they're not identical, but there is some overlap. What we have highlighted here are things that showed up in the HAL documentation, but not in the CubeMX generated code. And over here, we have things that were generated by CubeMX, but didn't show up in the HAL documentation. Let's see if we can figure out why. Let's start with an easy one. The HAL documentation told us to use this PWM start function. And this was something that even with the CubeMX generated code, we had to add manually in our main method. So even though it wasn't automatically generated, it was still required to start the timer. So that just leaves us with these four missing functions. Why did they show up in the HAL documentation, but not the generated code? We'll come back to this in just a second. Let's take a look at these two functions that were generated by CubeMX, but didn't show up in our HAL instructions. We'll start with this master config synchronization. I searched the HAL documentation and found this little excerpt of the function. The function description tells us that this configures the timer in master mode. That was one of the advanced parameters in CubeMX that we didn't mess with. This means that unless we're trying to set up our timer in master mode, we don't actually need this function call. Up next, I wanted to look for MSP post init. And this is one of the things that I said I didn't actually know what it did. And it turns out it doesn't even show up in the HAL documentation. So to find out what this function was doing, I held the control button and clicked on the function, which jumps me to the implementation. This is what the code looks like for MSP post init. After looking at this for a bit, two things stood out to me. These two functions here, clock enable and GPIO init, are two of those missing functions that we looked at earlier. So that means that they weren't missing after all and they were just buried within a different function. So of course, I had to know, do these two other functions actually show up in the generated code, just buried a little bit deeper? I performed a search across all of the files in this project for these two missing functions. And then I hunted through the results to see where it was actually being called. Sure enough, after a quick search, I ended up finding both of them. The hal tim pwm msp init function is actually called from within the hal tim pwm init function. And the hal rcc timer clock enable is buried just one layer lower. Hal tim base init calls hal tim base msp init, which then calls our function down here. Now something interesting is that the parent functions actually already showed up in our list. 
That just means that by calling these functions, we're indirectly calling the underlying functions as well. So now why did we spend so much time looking at this? Well, the moral of the story is that the generated code is doing the same thing that's described in the HAL documentation. They just organize it a little differently. So now at this point, hopefully you feel more comfortable about where this code is generated from. And if you don't like the code that CubeMX generates, now you know how to do it yourself by just reading the HAL documentation. So now let's use the HAL documentation to do something new. Let's figure out how to change the duty cycle using HAL. If you recall from earlier, the duty cycle is controlled by this pulse value here. So we need to figure out how to change the pulse value using HAL. We can do that using a function called HAL Tim set compare. Now I do have to admit something that's been bothering me for a little while. I do know that the HAL Tim set compare function is what we're looking for, but just by reading the HAL documentation, nothing really points you in that direction. The HAL documentation doesn't really say, if you want to change the duty cycle, use this function. So I'm not exactly sure how you would find this if you didn't already know what you were looking for. This is called out in the microcontroller's data sheet, it just doesn't show up in the HAL documentation. So anyway, let's jump in and figure out how to use this. The description is pretty helpful. It tells us that we can set the timer's capture compare register, which is the pulse, on runtime without having to call config channel again. We'll fill in everything that we need to know about this function down here. The first parameter that we need is the handle. This is really a reference to one of those complex timer objects. Since we're using timer2, we need to pass in a reference to timer2's handle. We can pass this variable by reference by using ampersand and then htim2. The next parameter that we need to specify is the channel. Since we're specifically using timer2 channel1 to generate our PWM output, we need to use channel1. So we'll pass in tim channel1 as the second argument. The third and final argument is the compare value. This tells us that this value specifies the capture compare register's new value. This is our pulse value. So this function down here is what we need to implement in code to change our duty cycle. Let's implement this inside of our infinite while loop to change our duty cycle on the fly. To start, I'm gonna to go to the user code section and create a variable that'll keep track of our pulse. We'll start with a pulse of zero and we'll count all the way up to 255 and then we'll tell it to start over. Now, inside of our while loop, we'll just increase this pulse value by typing in pulse equals pulse plus one. Next, we want this to restart after we hit 255, so I'm just gonna say if pulse is greater than 255, we're gonna set it back to zero. To all of you advanced programmers out there, yes, there's much cleaner ways to write this, but I'm gonna stick with this for simplicity. So now we're gonna use that hal call to change the duty cycle. So we're gonna do that by typing in underscore underscore hal tim uh, control space here, and I think that was set compare. Yep, there it is. And now we can pass in the three required arguments. The first is the reference to htim2. The second is the tim underscore channel, and I'm gonna use control space here to get tim channel one. And then our actual pulse value is just gonna be that variable that we created. Now, if we leave everything like this, it's gonna be increasing our duty cycle really fast. So we're gonna to wanna to add some sort of a delay so we can watch it happen. And we're gonna do that by using hal underscore delay, and we'll wait mm, 100 milliseconds. Actually, I'm changing my mind. We'll wait 10 milliseconds. Okay, you know the drill. Before we can push our code, we need to set the boot jumper to program mode and press the reset button. Okay, let's push the code and see what happens. All set, let's check it out. Now we need to set the blue pill back into run mode by changing the jumper and pressing reset one more time. Now I'm gonna hook up my oscilloscope. We'll start by hooking up the ground pin and then we'll probe pin PA0, which is timer two channel one. Hey look, it's working. We can see that our duty cycle is increasing from zero up to 100% or our pulse from zero up to 255 and then it starts over. Now we figured out how to use HAL, but it's time to go one step further bare metal. Now when I say bare metal, I mean that we're going to be controlling the microcontroller by manipulating the registers directly. We're literally shoving numbers into certain places of memory which is causing the microcontroller to do things. If you're programming at this low of a level, it often means that you need to do a lot of reading, and your code probably isn't going to make sense to anyone else unless they've also done a lot of reading. It's often significantly more complex to implement things at the bare metal level. So for the sake of simplicity, in this video, the only thing that we're going to change at the register level is going to be our pulse or duty cycle. To learn HAL, we looked at the HAL documentation, but now we want to look at the documentation for the microcontroller itself. 
What we're specifically looking for is called the reference manual, although I do tend to slip up and call this a datasheet every once in a while. The datasheet is more like the electrical characteristics, while the reference manual is more of the programming guides. So we want the reference manual for whatever microcontroller we're using. And once again, we have a nice 1,136 pages of technical documentation. This document also has a table of contents, just like the HAL documentation, but they also actually list it in the first couple of pages down here. What we want to find is all of the documentation for timers and PWM. We can see that timer documentation starts at chapter 14, and there's actually different rules depending on which timers we're using. So here's an example for timer 1 and 8, and on the next page we have examples for timer 2 to timer 5. For the blue pill, there's four timer sections. We have one for advanced control timers, two for general purpose timers, and one for basic timers. We're generating PWM using timer 2. So we want to refer to chapter 15, which describes general purpose timers, which includes timer 2. And if we keep looking through the table of contents for this chapter, eventually we can find a section on PWM mode, which is 15.3.9. So here's what section 15.3.9 looks like. And right away in the first sentence, it tells us pretty much exactly what we're looking for. It tells us that PWM mode allows us to generate a signal with a frequency determined by the TIMX ARR register and a duty cycle determined by the value of the TIMX CCRX register. So once again, we're trying to change the duty cycle, so the duty cycle is determined by the TIMX CCRX register. So this is the register that we're looking for. So by changing this register, we change the duty cycle. It's cool that we found out what the register is, but how do we change it? We could either use control F to search the datasheet for it, or we can go into the table of contents and find the description of all of the registers. The table of contents lists a ton of registers, and we can actually see the CCR registers that we're looking for. The description before called it CCRX, but here we can see that there's CCR1, 2, 3, and 4. So calling it CCRX is kind of just shorthand for any one of these. Now since we're using timer 2 channel 1 to generate our PWM signal, we want to look at the documentation for channel 1, which is CCR1. This section describes in detail what this CCR1 register is. And if you want to learn how to set this register directly by its memory address, I'd encourage you to go look at my series called Bare Metal Microcontrollers. But for this video, let's just make a mental note of this address offset, which is 3-4 in hex. Now, thankfully, we don't actually have to calculate that memory address ourselves. Part of the HAL is actually defining all of the registers and pointing them to their respective memory addresses. Pretty much any hardware abstraction layer that you're using, even if it's not the one by ST, is going to have a list of all of the registers and where they point to in memory. So in here, we can actually see where CCR1, 2, 3, and 4 are defined. And right here, they actually have a comment telling us that it's pointing to an address offset of 3, 4 in hex which is exactly the same as what they list in the datasheet. So now we want to change the duty cycle by manipulating the register directly instead of using this HAL call. So I'm just going to highlight this and delete it. In its place, we need to change timer 2's CCR1 register. And the way that we can access that register without having to find the memory address manually is typing in tim2 and then typing dot. You'll see that this autocorrects to an arrow because technically TIM2 is a pointer and in order to dereference a pointer you need to have the arrow instead of a dot. It's kind of cool that the IDE does this for you. Anyway, now we see a list of all of the registers that are inside of timer2. And right here we can see CCR1. So now we can set the value of CCR1 by just typing in equals and pulse. Now we want to test this out, and to make sure that we actually did something, we want our oscilloscope to look a little different, so I'm just going to change the delay on this from uh, 10 milliseconds to 1, so it should go really fast. Let's push the code. And there we have it. We're changing the duty cycle directly from the register. We can tell that we actually did something because now this is going a lot faster than before. As we continue to learn new things, there's always going to be a trade-off between using CubeMX, HAL, or bare metal implementations. So hopefully, after watching this video, you understand the strengths and weaknesses of all three of these things. And even if you don't like working at such a low level, at least now you should have some level of comfort understanding what's happening behind the scenes of generated code. Additionally, this applies to more than just STM32s. Pretty much all microcontrollers have a very similar stack up. I was invited to give a presentation at the Embedded Online Conference 2021. So my next video is actually going to be focused on this. The actual conference starts on May 17th, so it might be a little while before you see my next video uploaded.
As soon as I finish that video, I'll start part 5 of this series. That's all for now, see you next time. As I mentioned earlier, I made a mistake in my last video when talking about the auto reload preload. I said you needed to enable it to cause the timer to restart over and over again, but it turns out that that is not true at all. You can completely ignore this, but I did want to say what it actually does. Something we saw earlier when looking at the PWM mode documentation is that we see the frequency is determined by the ARR register. That's the auto reload register. This is the number that our timer counts up to before starting over at zero. If this is the auto reload register, what is the auto reload preload? If we do look at the documentation for the ARR register, we see this little note here telling us to refer to section 15.3.1 for more details about the ARR register and update behavior. When we jump to this section, it tells us that the auto reload register is preloaded. So writing to or reading from the auto reload register is actually accessing the preload register. And then the contents of whatever we write to that preload registered are transferred to the shadow register. Spooky. The reference manual even gives us two timing diagrams to show what happens when auto reload preload is disabled and what happens when it's enabled. Here you can see the shadow register kind of lagging behind the preload register. So overall, this is totally not important unless we're reading to or writing from the auto reload register a lot.